Welcome back, Spare Parts Army. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Germany recently announced they're gonna supply Ukraine with around 40 Martyr infantry fighting vehicles, hopefully by March of 2023. This 50-year-old vehicle is better than you might think. Sure, it's not Germany's newest generation of Puma IFEs, which recently made headlines for their technical problems, but sometimes a battle and time-tested solution is better at a time like this. But some would argue many of these Western armored vehicles have never been truly battle tested since most of them have only seen combat in counterinsurgency missions in the Middle East instead of a large force on force action. Why did Germany offer these IFEs to Ukraine now instead of months ago? Could this be the beginning of the end for Russia or will it have a negligible effect on the battlefield? First, the martyr can trace its roots to what many sources call the world's first infantry fighting vehicle. You see, in World War II, German-made tanks had success breaking through Soviet lines, but once they'd broken through into enemy territory, they found that their tanks could be surrounded and taken rather easily by Soviet infantry once their tanks had slowed. Germany tried adding more infantry to their tank divisions, but the soldiers on the ground had a hard time keeping up with the fast-moving tanks. Walking can be exhausting. What they needed was a way to deliver soldiers alongside, or rather inside of their tanks. For decades after World War II, Germany poured their blood, sweat, and tears into perfecting a troop transport that had the right mix of firepower and armor. Based on this, Germany created what many sources call the world's first purpose-built infantry fighting vehicle, the Schützenpanzer Lang HS-30 in 1958. This vehicle concept had all of the qualities that go into your modern IFV package. You got the high speed, plenty of armor, room for infantry to get cozy in the back, and of course a big bad cannon turret up top to protect everyone. But first attempts don't always nail it. There was a bunch of issues with the HS-30. It was unreliable. And that's where the work on the Martyr One began. The vehicle was intended to be an upgrade for the Schützenpanzer Lang HS-30. The main design objectives for the new vehicle were to have a capacity of 12 infantrymen to sport a more reliable 20 mm cannon. Germany issued development contracts to multiple different companies and 15 different prototypes for the Martyr Infantry Fighting Vehicle were produced by 1963. In 1967, the Reinstall Group created a third and final group of 10 prototypes that eventually led to the production of the Martyr in 1969. Reinstall became the prime contractor and the first Martyr was delivered to West Germany in May 1971. By 1975, they produced over 2,100 Martyrs, which West Germany kept and stockpiled in the midst of the Cold War. The Martyr was named after the European Pine Martin, an agile weasel-like creature that lives in the trees. I wouldn't compare the IFE to a weasel, but the Martyr is known for having a nice balance of armor and mobility. Are weasels well-armored? Can Martyrs climb trees? I don't know. A common tactic that you see used with these IFEs that my unit actually used in Iraq as well is you have what's called air guards or soldiers hanging out the back of the vehicle through the hatches. Any sane person might wonder why are these troops hanging outside the protection of the armor? It's to protect the vehicle's one major vulnerability, which is its close proximity blind spots. Infantry hanging outside the vehicle are there to stop anyone who's hiding in a bush five meters away waiting to throw a shape charge hand grenade. The Martyrs manufacturer, Rheinmetall, back in September of 2022, made a press release stating that they had just finished restoring and upgrading 16 Martyr IFVs for the purpose of being sent to Ukraine. Rheinmetall reportedly were already working on an additional 14 and planned to have 70 finished. We know it costs about $133 million to upgrade 78 Martyrs. We know what this upgrade package normally includes. It has a replacement for the old 1980s equipment in the new Rheinmetall it's all Electronic Sapphire 2.6. The high resolution sensor improves observational range and reconnaissance abilities. And this is one of the most overlooked factors about why these vehicles, I think, will make such a huge difference on the battlefield. They are assets for the infantry to use to get better situational awareness. These are the eyes of the infantrymen. I think what we might be seeing is a new phase in the war that will be characterized by who is able to best integrate their infantry tactics with their tank strategy. The upgraded version includes a 750 horsepower engine instead of the 600 horsepower one, so it should be able to handle the heavier armor better in the mud. The German government and member states of NATO alliance allegedly had decided amongst themselves not to send Western model tanks and infantry fighting vehicles to Ukraine. However, this goalpost started to shift when many countries started sending the American M113 
and the British Spartan armored vehicle to the armed forces of Ukraine. These vehicles lack heavy cannon firepower though, but these vehicles turned out to be extremely useful for Ukraine in their first counteroffensive operation. But the original Martyr weighed just under 30 tons and could travel up to 47 miles per hour, but additional armor added to the Martyr 1A3 iteration of the vehicle would add about five more tons of weight, mostly additional armor to counter the rising threat of anti-tank missiles, but this meant a trade-off of slowing it down to a top speed of 40 miles per hour. It was designed to match the mobility of its best friend on the battlefield, the Leopard main battle tank. <clears throat> the Martyr without its Leopard is like Robin without Batman. The vehicle carries 172 gallons of fuel, giving it a road range of just over 300 miles, although in combat that distance is probably about half that due to a higher fuel consumption and idle times. It's propelled by a deal track, which can be fitted with rubber road pads. Rubber band tracks have a lot of benefits. They cause the tank to vibrate less and are much more quiet, which actually has a big effect on tank crews. The loud high vibration can wear down and fatigue a tank crew quickly. But I kind of doubt that Ukraine will use rubber tracks for a few reasons, although I, I could be very wrong. Most rubber tracks currently cannot be replaced in sections. The entire band track needs to be thrown out and replaced when damaged. This makes maintaining them in combat more difficult. The Martyr is capable of fording in up to 1.5 meters of water and can be fitted with a kit to allow it to ford in water up to 2.5 meters deep. It can carry up to nine total soldiers, three crew, and six infantry just short of the initial goal of 12 person capacity. This gives the vehicle more carrying capacity for ferrying troops into battle compared to the American M2 Bradley. The driver has three day periscopes, one of which can be replaced with a night vision device. The center of the hull holds the two-man turret, the commander sits on the right, and the gunner on the left. The commander has eight-day periscopes and the gunner has three. The updated version of the tank includes thermal sights with two and eight X magnification. The IFE's main armament is the 20mm Rheinmetall Mark 20 RH202 autocannon that fires AP rounds at 1,100 meters per second. It's mounted in the small two-man turret and is able to fire armor-piercing and high-explosive rounds for anti-personnel. The 7.62 MG3 machine gun attached coaxially to the left of the cannon allows gunners to save main gun rounds if a soft target is in the open and not behind cover. The Milan anti-tank guided missile launcher can be attached to the turret. This holds up to four missiles carried inside the hull. I've seen conflicting reports on whether or not adding the Milan missile launcher and its storage reduces the infantry capacity down to five dismounts. Early versions of the Martyr had a second remote controlled MG3 mounted on the rear of the vehicle to provide cover for infantry as they dismounted. This was discarded in later models though, along with the four gun ports, which allowed infantry inside the IFE to fire at enemy on the outside. The gun ports were abandoned in the Martyr 1A3 models when an extra layer of armor and storage boxes was added to the design. We see this decision to discard the firing ports was done across most IFEs and Western militaries at the time. The original idea behind them was that it would allow soldiers to engage the enemy if they were fighting in a war zone that had recently been nuked. This goes to show the level of fear military planners had about the likelihood of an atomic war in the early 60s, when a lot of these IFEs were originally developed. The German IFE has a hole made of welded steel which gives it protection from small arms fire and shell fragments. The original vehicle provided protection up to 20 mm armor piercing, discarding Sabo rounds. But the A3 would protect up to 30 mm rounds, which are the same type fired by the Russian vehicles. It's among the best armor in the world. Like how you go to New York for a bagel and a cheese sandwich, you go to Germany for the top notch armor engineering. The Martyr also has two banks of three electronically operated 76 mm smoke grenade dischargers to provide cover for the vehicle in close proximity. So if Russian soldiers try to fire anti-tank guided missiles at the Martyr, Ukrainian soldiers can deploy a smoke screen in an attempt to prevent the hit. There have been many versions of the Martyr over the years. In fact, Germany has had a hard time getting rid of the vehicle. The most common version is the 1A3, which was developed in the late 80s and 90s. This is the version with the added armor and the weight that slowed it down a bit. The Martyr 1A4 added a cryptology capable radio, and the Martyr 1A5 added mine protection and later IED protection. And very importantly, it had multi spectral camouflage. And while traditional military camouflage like paint and camo nets that have leaves on it are an attempt to hide the tank from the visible spectrum, multi spectral camouflage is a modern method of trying to hide objects from thermal, infrared, and radar signature. This effort is extremely important, and it's often a factor that's completely forgotten 
in modern warfare, because we've been up against an enemy without much in the way of thermal imaging capabilities. But today, it's one of the main ways the enemy spots you, oftentimes using UAVs with thermal cameras. This NATO research paper that I found explains our attempt to mask a vehicle's heat signature to imitate vegetation, soil, and clay. You can see here in 4.2.1, this section talks about how they've already had some success in fooling enemy thermal cameras with these nets. One surprising fact about the Martyr IFE is that it wasn't used in combat for its first 38 years of existence. It was involved in peacekeeping missions in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, but it wasn't until 2009 that it was involved in its first combat operations against the Taliban in the Chahar Dara district of Afghanistan's Kunduz province. In July of 2009, a German combat outpost defended against the Taliban attack using the Martyr IFV. Troops were able to wound dozens of enemy Taliban, reportedly. The vehicle proved very useful in battle despite their age. German troops described them as a great tactical asset. The best historical analogy for how the Martyr might perform in Ukraine would be the German-led offensive to capture and hold the town codename Operation Hamazag against Taliban fighters in Kuala Tala. On the 31st of October in 2010, reports indicate it was likely 100 enemy Taliban fighters defending the town. We're able to learn about it by translating a German post with first-hand accounts by German soldiers from the battle. One single martyr held back a Taliban attempt to outflank 300 dismounted German paratroopers who had gotten out of their armored vehicles. The German IFE was able to protect them with its thermal optics ability that was easily able to pick off the enemy. The operation goal was to capture an enemy held town, so I think there are a lot of parallels to how it could potentially be used for the types of operations Ukraine might be planning. To get an idea about the vehicle's limitations, there was one IED strike in June 2011 when a German martyr was catastrophically destroyed in Kunduz. It took a 450-pound IED for one soldier to be KIA and five others injured in the vehicle. Forbes estimates that each of Ukraine's army's two dozen mechanized brigades would need approximately 100 IFVs to be useful. Ukraine has been interested in Germany's martyr IFVs for a while now. Dmitry Kleba, Ukraine's Minister of Foreign Affairs, expressed his disappointment in Germany on Twitter for withholding their martyr and leopard main battle tanks back in September of 2022. He wrote, Disappointing signals from Germany, while Ukraine needs leopards and martyrs now, to liberate people and save them from genocide, not a single rational argument on why these weapons cannot be supplied. Only abstract fears and excuses. What is Berlin afraid of that Kiev is not? And it looks like their prayers may have been answered because Germany has just agreed to send the Leopard main battle tank. The US and other NATO countries have provided Ukraine with monetary and military support throughout the ongoing war with Russia, but this offering is completely different. This move signifies not only a willingness by NATO allies to up their support for Ukraine in the face of Putin's aggression, but more importantly, it marks a turning point in Ukraine's overall approach to the war. In some areas, Zelensky and his troops are moving from defense to offense with support of the Western world, which could spell the beginning of the end for Russia. However, Russian forces recently made tactical advances, reportedly capturing the city of Soldar near Bakhmut. So why is Germany having a change of heart now? Well. First, they didn't want to act unilaterally, they wanted to act trilaterally. I don't think I'm using that term correctly, but what I'm meaning to say is that Germany acted in cooperation with France and the United States to send similar capabilities to Ukraine at the same time. France announced on January 5th that they'd be sending the AMX-10RC armored fighting vehicles to Ukraine. Ukraine President Zelensky praised the move and encouraged other Western nations to do the same. The next day, the USA announced that they'd be sending around 50 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles to Ukraine as part of a $2.8 billion weapons package. Germany made their martyr announcement the very same day. Strength in numbers, right? I think the West had a change of heart for a few reasons. They didn't want to send massive amounts of weapons all at once but they have chosen to do it slowly over time to avoid provoking Russia. They didn't want to send hundreds of high firepower IFVs to Ukraine only to find out that they would be captured by Russia, but since Ukraine has shown that they're more than safe of an investment, it's easier to justify sending these vehicles now. But that is, of course, just speculation and I could be wrong. Meanwhile, at the same time, the German defense minister, Christine Lambrecht, remained hesitant to send a proper high firepower infantry fighting vehicle. She said in September, quote, 
No country has yet delivered Western-style armored personnel carriers or main battle tanks, and we have agreed with our partners that we will not do it alone. A lot of support, especially by European nations so far, has been indirect and measured as to not provoke Putin, who has made nuclear threats in the face of new equipment being sent to Ukraine. The 500 Russian armored vehicles captured by Ukraine, the ones left behind by retreating Russian soldiers, will need extensive repairs before being sent into battle. Current best estimates place Ukraine with about 1,000 IFVs of their own. But these would mostly be ex-Soviet BMP-1s. The BMP-1 are also a Cold War era relic, but they haven't been upgraded over the years like the Martyr or one. The more modern equipment would give Ukraine a better fighting chance. The initial amount of IFVs pledged by the US, Germany, and France wouldn't be able to meet this mark, but it's a great start and could be just the beginning. The fact that these countries are pledging these IFVs to Ukraine now shows that Ukraine is fighting to win. It also shows that the Western world isn't afraid of Putin's nuclear threats as they once were. There is a plan to win, and there is a united front forming. Will Ukraine's plan work? Is it foolish for the Western world to underestimate and provoke Putin? I don't claim to have the answers to that, and only time will tell. If you like this video, please consider checking out this one and hitting the like and subscribe button. Thank you for watching Spare Parts Army. I greatly appreciate your time, and I'll see you guys next time.